Hello and welcome. <laughs> Hello, my name is Yashvi Patel, sophomore class of 2024. I'm studying both physics as an honors major and math as an honors minor and course major. So it is my great pleasure to introduce John Mather, class of 1968 and a senior project scientist at the James Webb Space Telescope. Dr. Mather graduated with, from Swarthmore with highest honors and also achieved the highest possible score on the physics, physics grad records exam. He then went west to the University of California in Berkeley, where his thesis project was to measure the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background radiation. It failed in its first flight, only to succeed after he left Berkeley, but then he took a postdoc position at NASA in New York City. There, he led the effort to propose the Cosmic Background Exploration Satellite, or COBE, and then moved to the Goddard Flight Space Center in Greenland, Maryland. He served as its project scientist, leading the COBE team to success, and later the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2006. The COBE measurements started the precision Sorry, the Kobe measurements started the era of precision cosmology, conforming the expanding universe theory to extraordinary accuracy. Dr. Smather speaks widely about the history of the universe and the astonishing possibilities of our shared future. Amongst his many awards and honors, he was awarded an honorary doctor of science from Swarthmore in 1994. On a personal note, as, so, as an aspiring physicist, who has been studying dark matter models in the early universe for the past year. Dr. Mather's accomplishments and work in similar fields inspires me. Last year, the physics department held a watch party for the release of Webb's first images. Today, I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Mather back to Swarthmore to share his insights on this groundbreaking telescope. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Matter as he presents opening the infrared treasure chest with the James Webb Space Telescope. Thank you. Well, my goodness, it's such a pleasure to be back to the college, and I'm remembering back when I first arrived in 1964 as an incoming freshman. I think there was nothing that I'm going to tell you about that we could have imagined in that year, nothing. So we knew, we had a lot of questions, but we didn't expect to be able to answer them. So I was a, a somewhat intimidated young freshman and coming from a country school, and I will show you a little bit about that, but then I want to get on to the whole history of the universe and what's propelled, <laughs> propelled us to just try to keep work on these things. So on the first slide, we've got a picture of the telescope itself, James Webb Space Telescope. It is the most powerful space telescope we've ever built. It is enormous. That big golden hexagon in the middle is a mirror, concave mirror, and it receives starlight and galaxy light and focuses it into the instrument package behind. Uh, it is six and a half meters in diameter. That is, we should use metric units, right? Uh, anyway, it's tw which is 20.3 feet across. So, and the uh, big gray thing underneath it is a umbrella, five layers of metallized plastic, uh, as big as a tennis court. So that's to keep it cold, so we can pick up light from very cool objects out there in the distant universe. So, okay, uh, what's the project about? It's a joint international project of NASA with the European and Canadian space agencies. Uh, and it's now available for all astronomers everywhere in the world to use it. You send us a proposal, we'll read it. If your idea is good, we'll take a picture for you. So uh, anyway, it took 20,000 people to build this thing, uh, spread out mostly in this country, but uh, and quite a large budget, as you might guess, and uh, it's now working almost perfectly. Very nearly, totally perfect. Anyway, so we'll show you a little bit about uh, what we're doing, but before I do that, I want to get back to the questions that interested me even when I was six years old, although I didn't have the words for them yet. Um, 
When I was six, my dad told me at bedtime one night that pe people and living things are made of cells, and inside the cells are chromosomes, and this was before you even knew the double helix story. Uh, so anyway, those chromosomes determine our fate. So who knows how that works? We still don't know how that works. Uh, but at any rate, we know something is in there that does something. So astronomers now can work on the, what the, we call the cosmic history. Um, what did the atoms do since the earliest moments? So uh, even back in 1953, when I was a little guy, there was already known some of the history, but not much was clear. Um, everybody wants to know, are we alone? Uh, and a lot of people are pretty afraid of the neighbors. Um, I'm not, actually, because they're too dang far away, as far as we can tell. Um, but sure, it would be nice to know that, and it would tell us something about whether life itself is something that occurs only very, very, very rarely, requiring some kind of cosmic coincidence or extreme something or other, or even divine intervention, as most scientists seem to imagine not long ago. Um, and uh, so that's the question, is life a miracle, or is it something that will always happen given a chance? That's my guess, by the way. Um, so how far can we go? Well, personally, we can't go very far. The solar system is already plenty big enough as a challenge, uh, and we can get to Mars, uh, and we can't yet bring you home, but we could get you to Mars in, <laughs> in a while. Um, but astronomers, we can travel everywhere because we take pictures and then we tell stories and make movies and computer simulations so we can go anywhere at the speed of imagination. So, uh, okay, so what are we trying to imagine? Well, a uh, little history here. Uh, Lucretius had a, a little poem from over 2,000 years ago on, on the nature of things in Latin. And here's a lovely translation. Um, he knew about the atomic theory. He knew that possibly what you see is made out of tiny, tiny, tiny particles that are so small you can't see them. Uh, and they had some evidence. They didn't have the equipment but we, that we have, but you could say a glass of water is going to evaporate. It's going to turn into something. Where does it go? Maybe tiny particles. So they knew uh, of that. So they had the idea, well, these particles can stick together and make big things. Um, and then they are ephemeral. They had the idea of linguistics even is included in this little poem. We give names to things and then stuff disappears. And, and it, so anyway, this was a poem which was uh, actively suppressed by the medieval monks, but one copy escaped. And there's a whole book called The Swerve that tells the story of this poem and how it was rediscovered. Uh, by a book collector. Okay, so uh, that uh, tells us that we have been thinking about these topics for a long time. Now here's where I started thinking about these topics. This is the research farm in far northern New Jersey. Uh, Rutgers University uh, had it, and my dad was working there to study dairy, dairy cows, how to get more and better milk. Higher protein, more quantity, uh, less food for the animals it would be nice if they could do that. Well, anyway, so that's actually a research facility as well as the home for many bulls. So it was a nice place for me to grow up and to learn science from books. They came around on the bookmobile every two weeks. So I read all the science books. What do I do? And that's, that's my, the beginning of my education out there in the countryside. So uh, looking back a little bit in history, um, uh, back in 1946 or so, this is Lyman Spitzer, who was a very famous astronomer. And he wrote a report in that year that, well, okay, well, now we've finished the World War, we should start thinking about telescopes. You could put them in space. And of course, being that he was working for the Rand Corporation at the time, you could look down at the Earth. But you could also look up, because he's an astronomer, and he wrote about what we could do with a tele telescope in space. A little while later, he even wrote, if you could make a good enough one, say, get a big asteroid and polish the surface to be a parabolic mirror, you could see planets around other stars. So he was a very forward thinker, and we actually eventually named a telescope for him. Okay, what else had went on? Here is Sir Fred Hoyle, a man who gave the name of Big Bang Theory, uh, and has confused the heck out of us ever since, because it's a terrible <laughs> name. Um, but anyway, he was a brilliant man, and he did not like the idea of the expanding universe that we tell today. So what else happened? I turned up in 1946, <laughs> along with most of the other members of my class of 1968, uh, it's quite remarkable how that works. Uh, so um, anyway, 1946 was a good year for science. Uh, a, little, <laughs> a little while later, in 1948, uh, the two gentlemen on the left and the right, uh, uh, Robert Al Herman and Ralph Alpher, uh, 
worked out the idea of the Big Bang, what we call the Big Bang, and they said, uh, not only is the universe probably expanding, because we had evidence of that, uh, but it would have been hot when it was young, and the heat of the early universe should still be available to measure, uh, and nobody went to measure. But 300 people came to the thesis defense of Ralph Alpher. Now, people should have measured, but they didn't. If they'd known there was a Nobel Prize waiting for them, they might have tried harder. <laughs> um, so the Nobel Prize was given in 1965 for the actual discovery in New Jersey at Bell Labs. Uh, in 1954 or so, uh, people thought, oh, we're going to see the canals on Mars. And I was taken down to the Museum of Natural History in New York and saw the planetarium show. Oh, I want to know everything about this. And there's the map with the canals. They're not there. Um, <laughs> We do have a good idea of what they really were. The observers have uh, retinas in their eyes and their blood vessel patterns in the back of your eye. And it does seem that's possible as an explanation. So, darn. So, but a few little while later, Sputnik went up in, I guess, October of 1957 and scared the crap out of this country. Even though we'd been warned many times and had been written up in the New York Times about 25 times already that this was going to happen, Nevertheless, when it did happen, people said, oh crap, they can bomb us from above. And so those were the years when at least my generation was taught to hide under the desk in case of nuclear attack. So you don't have to be a grown-up to figure out that's not going to work. <laughs> but anyway, what else are you going to do? Well, and that, of course, uh, the next thing uh, the, gov the federal government did is we started NASA. And we have the charter there on the left, um, and it was... Uh, I think the owner, only federal science agency which says in the charter from Congress, please tell people what you found. So we have a pretty active public affairs office, which I'm glad of. And then um, there's Jack Kennedy. He's going to tell us why we're going to the moon. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. So he did a lot of, done a lot, made a lot of promises in that talk. He said we're going to go to the moon, which we did, and we actually landed there about seven years after that, which was totally astonishing to me. I thought that was way too hard, and if you imagine back to when you could calculate orbits with a slide rule. Well, that was a good challenge. Um, he also said, not, not only are we going to do this, we're going to do the other things too. And he meant solving the other problems that he knew the world faces, including our racism and lots of other things going on at the time. So he made big promises, and he said, we're going to do them all. So we shouldn't lose sight of that. Anyway, here is the man who made the plan. Uh, that's James Webb, who was the head of NASA at the time. An interesting, useful story about him. Um, he was in the taxi cab going to the president to see what, to make his request for the budget for the Apollo program. And he thought, I don't think I'd trust the budget I've got. I'm going to double it. So he doubled the budget in the taxi cab, um, and it was about enough. So you can imagine that he knew enough about people like me, scientists and engineers, not to completely trust our optimism. <laughs> That's good. So. And it's not the first time that we needed to have that cautious risk analysis that said, I don't know what you guys are talking about, but it's going to need more money. <laughs> so anyway, James Webb. Um, so now, how do we survey the universe? Uh, as you know, we all have time machines in our eyes. We look at things as they were when light was sent out to us. So, um, well, now you don't need to know how far are you looking away to see how long you're looking back in time. So astronomers have two classic methods. Ancient Greeks would have understood them both. In fact, they did do the first part. You draw triangles and measure angles. And if you know one side of a triangle and two angles, then you can survey the universe. 
So they measured the size of the Earth, they measured the distance to the Moon, and they got him about right. Um, the other method basically says if a thing is fainter, uh, if two things are identical and one is fainter, it could be that it's farther away. And so that gives us the other method. So that you can survey the universe now. Um, the other thing we wanted to do is uh, see how are things moving? Well, most things do not move apparently across the sky, uh, but many of them seem to go away from us at some great speed. So this is done with spectroscopy. You spread out the light of a star or a galaxy into a rainbow. Uh, and it has colors when sometimes there are special colors that are different from the others in the sense either they're bright at certain wavelengths, uh, like when you see the fireworks in the summer, they're particular chemical elements that emit at certain wavelengths. Sometimes they're dark because some element in the surface of the sun is absorbing certain wavelengths. So, okay, so the nature has given us marks on the rainbow. And now if you see the rainbow from a distant object, quite often all of the wavelengths are multiplied by some number you say, hmm, this means the object is going away from us at a certain speed, and that's the interpretation. So now we can survey not only distance, but motion. So back in 1929, Edwin Hubble drew this graph for us. Um, each little dot is a, represents a galaxy. A galaxy being 100 billion stars, more or less, hung, hung together by gravity. Uh, and on the horizontal direction is how far away he thought they were on the vertical direction of how fast they were going away from us. And you see a couple of things. Well, one is there's a big trend. The farther away they are, the faster they're going. Uh, if you divide the distance by the speed, you get the apparent age of the universe. 1929, first time we had a clue that there is such a thing as the age of the universe, that it's not just infinite. So that was a huge surprise, for, even including Einstein did not believe it at first. Um, the other thing, uh, sort of interesting, the, there are four little dots in the lower left corner where they're coming toward us. That's going to be exciting too. <laughs> Although we won't be here. So, okay, 1929 he'd do this. Uh, 1927, there was a painter by George Lemaitre who had used Einstein's equations to predict that this must be true. Einstein made fun of him. He said, your, int your physics is abominable. So, okay, well, Einstein, the lady realized that was a big mistake. Uh, another story to tell about Georges Lemaitre. He uh, was a Catholic priest in Belgium. He also had a PhD from MIT in math. So he was able to use Einstein's equations and get the right answer and say, yes, uh, what he said was the universe started from he, what he called a primeval atom, which is also a little confusing because it gives the idea that it's a finite object. But at any rate, um, 1929. So what happens next? Well, uh, I was here and finished up school in 1968 here. I went out to, that was uh, three years after the cosmic microwave radiation was discovered, which is the primeval heat that those two guys were predicting. So they, we knew it was there. It confirmed the idea of the expanding universe. And so I went from here to Berkeley for graduate school. Um, and so oh, knocking around, well, I want to find a thesis project. Oh. People are going to go try to measure this. Okay, I'll try that. Sounds cool. Um, I worked on it for a while. Uh, the second experiment we tried did not work, so I had to write a thesis about a project that did not work. <laughs> Happens. So uh, my thesis advisor was generous, and he let me say I had done enough to get a doctorate, and I got a, a job at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York City. So here it is. It's upstairs from Tom's Restaurant at 112th and Broadway. And you'd never know it was there, uh, but it is. And Tom's restaurant is pretty famous because it was on Steinfeld, Seinfeld. Uh, more famous than the, in, than the laboratory. Uh, but at any rate, I was there and the NASA said, we want proposals for new satellite missions. This is five years after the moon landing and we're not doing any of them anymore. So what's next? So, okay, boss, my thesis project failed. We should try it in outer space. So we called up our friends, we wrote a very thin proposal, we said our idea is this. And a couple of years later, NASA said, yeah, that's a good idea, we're gonna start some work on it. And so I moved down to the big laboratory in Greenmelt, Maryland, and uh, got serious about it. And then the rest was, it finally worked. So here is, oh, come, come on. There is our little observatory in outer space. Uh, it took us quite a lot of effort, it took about 15 years from the first concept to launch. 
but it went up and it did work because real engineers made it work. Uh, it took about 1,500 people to make it work, and um, we ended up writing a book about that. Uh, so uh, another, t anyway, if you want it called, if you want to get the copy, it's called The Very First Light. Anyway, uh, it did two things when it measured the spectrum to see if the color of the radiation is exactly right, which it is, and then we got this second thing, which I'll show you now. We made a map. We wanted to know, is the sky uniform? If you had wave, eyes that could see millimeter wavelengths, so you could see this cosmic radiation directly, um, you'd want to know, where does it come from? Is it the same in all directions? And the first order answer is yes, it's the same in all directions. That means it's cosmic. The next answer is, well, it's a little brighter over there than over there, and we say that's because we're moving. And the third answer is, well, it has hot and cold spots. And that was pretty interesting. And when Stephen, Stephen Hawking saw the chart, he said, that's the most important scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time. So why was he excited about that? Well, number one, uh, as we understand it, we could not exist without those spots. Those spots say the universe had a way to stop the expansion locally. So that we start off with the cosmic material is all rushing apart, spreading out. Something has to stop it. So this, if there's an area that's a little more dense than average, perhaps just no more, enough more gravity than average, the gravity can stop the expansion and pull that stuff back together. So we are here because of those spots. Um, number two, most of the spots are made by something we can't see called cosmic dark matter. And number three, if we ever figure out what made the spots, maybe we'll have a handle on quantum gravity, which is a huge puzzle for science. So, okay, that's how it supposedly all started. And then what happened next? Uh, well, I got to go off to Stockholm and get a prize. Um, <laughs> I showed my graph a lot of times. That graph, by the way, got a standing ovation from the Astronomy Society. <laughs> and, uh, and then um, it was really nice to go off and have parties and speeches in Stockholm after that. That was 06. But before 06, I was already working on my next project. So we said, uh, what are we gonna do after that, uh, after the Kobe project? Come on. Um, we need to check what is a prediction of this story. So we had launched the Hubble Space Telescope in April of 1990, just a few months after the Cosmic Background Explorer went up, and it's now 33 years old and working beautifully. And that's because we sent astronauts five times up to visit it and fix it and make it better. So taking pictures with the Hubble, it didn't take them long to say, well, there are a few things we want to know that we cannot answer with the Hubble. So a little beautiful little poetic book was written that said, please build another telescope that's more powerful and can pick up wavelengths that Hubble cannot measure. That is to say, infrared wavelengths. And by the way, while we're at it, please figure out how to see planets orbiting around other stars because we'd like to know if we're alone or not. So, okay, the little book was written. Uh, the head of NASA said, we're gonna do it. So that was 96 and it took us a long time, like till we launched it in two, a year and a half ago, on Christmas morning of 2021, from French Guiana. And there it is going up. It looks dark in the picture, but it's actually bright sunshine. It's just that the automatic exposure uh, set it up, so it looks that way. But it was a perfect launch, and it means that we're going to get about 20 years of mission lifetime to use this observatory. And I'm going to tell you why we built it and what we hope to see and what we are seeing with it. But before that, I'll show you where we put it. We put it orbiting, oops, around, oops, that was, oops, oops, uh, orbiting around a place called Lagrange Point 2. So if you take a line from the sun to the earth and go another million miles out, that's called the Lagrange Point 2. And if you put something there, the combined gravity of the sun and the earth will pull it around the sun once a year. We stay with it. So it's a good place to put the telescope and you can put up the umbrella and the sun, the earth, and the moon are all on one side. So the telescope can be cold. <clears throat> which, which we need because we want to pick up things at longer wavelengths, which, so anyway, we don't want the telescope to emit the infrared we're trying to observe. So why do we want to observe infrared light? And it's because three things. One is um, that we want to be able to see the places where stars are being born. Uh, and they happen inside dust clouds. All those beautiful clouds that you see out in space with the glowing gas and stars in them, now, those are places where stars are being born and, the, and they're 
pretty opaque in the places where the stars are happening. So here's a picture that Hubble took, and there's a star in the middle, and you can hardly tell what's going on because the dust is bright and opaque at the same time. So Hubble got an infrared picture of the same spot. And you can see, well, the dust is opening up. It's letting us see in. Uh, the dust is much more transparent at the infrared wavelengths than at visible ones. So now you can see the star is in there, and it's also sending out jets of material, which is pretty typical of uh, stars being born. So how is the sun born? Probably like this, but we're going to get more pictures. So another thing is we want to pick up infrared light because it comes from objects that are not warm enough to emit their own visible light. Something like the sun. The sun is hot, but you are not. So you reflect sunshine, but you emit a lot of infrared. Each of you is putting out about 500 watts of infrared power. And if you were out there in space, we'd be able to see you a long ways away, millions of miles away with our telescope. Anyway, uh, so here's an example of a star we're looking at, which is sending out puffs of gas uh, as it's getting old. This happens a lot. And, uh, and it's, there are parts that are too cool for us to pick up the, 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 uh, the direct light of the, uh, anyway. The infrared now shows us new features, including the fact that on the right side, there are really two stars in the middle. So why is this particular story important? We call this a planetary nebula, but what it really is is, is a star getting old and sending out its material back into outer space to be recycled into further generations of stars. So um, the Big Bang gave us hydrogen and helium, only two elements. All the rest of the stuff that you see in the house and the building that we're made of, carbon, oxygen, iron, phosphorus, calcium, they were all made in nuclear reactions inside stars that came to the end of their lives and either they blow up or they spit up. So um, this is material coming back out to be recycled. So all of us here are made out of recycled stars, as I guess you know. So sometimes it's very pretty to look at because here is a picture we got that comes from one star that's emitting material and absorbing it around another one. So every time they go around, it sends out another pulse of gas and dust. So we can pick it up this way. And then, well, number one is beautiful, but number two, it's a laboratory for us to understand the processes that are going into how stars get old. Third reason we want to study infrared light is space is expanding. So when I drew you the picture that Edwin Hubble showed, um, we said, oh, the galaxies are going away from us at great speeds. So the other way you can think about it is the space itself is expanding, which is also mysterious, um, but it's a different way of thinking. Anyway, if, if space is expanding, then when we see distant objects, we're going to receive the light um, that comes from them at longer wavelengths. So the, the sketch is trying to tell you that when we look at a distant object, the wavelengths of light that we get are longer. So we need an infrared telescope to pick that up. So now I'm going to show you some of our results. Here is the first picture that President Biden put out on July 11th last year. Uh, and it's uh, got a lot of excitement for astronomers. So what's it got in the middle? It's got a big star with a hexagonal pattern with the rays sticking out. As far as we know, it's not especially interesting. It's just a bright star. Uh, what we are interested in is uh, all the funny looking little arcs, little pink arcs in there. And they are caused by that big fat fuzzy galaxy in the middle, which has so much mass in it that it's bending space. And the spa as space is bent according to Einstein's equations, and it means that the, this object acts like a lens, an extra lens on the telescope. So it's magnifying the images of much more distant galaxies, so those pink arcs are very, very much farther away and we can get magnification of 10 or 100 times what we would have had. So of course, we knew this was happening. That's why we pointed the telescope over there. And we are very pleasantly surprised to see how much there is to see in this picture. So astronomers are writing dozens and dozens and dozens of papers about this one picture. So we are very interested to find out what are the galaxies like when they're young, uh, which is to say looking back as far in time as you can. So this is uh, what we do. We, we spread out the light of the star into a spectrum. How bright is it at each different wavelength? And the pattern here has, has been marked to show that a typical thing is light is bright at wavelengths longer than some number and faint at the shorter wavelengths. And that tells us 
basically how far away the object is. So they've selected a handful of objects that are all very far away, and that means we're getting close to, within a few hundred million years of the first objects that grew out of the Big Bang material. So it's pretty, and it's a scientifically exciting, and many, many papers are written about these as well. Uh, so here's a picture to illustrate that we had a wonderful surprise coming out of this. Um, we looked to see what are the first galaxies like? And uh, the answer is they're not like we said they would be. They're much brighter than we thought they would be. They're bigger, they're hotter, uh, they're much more massive than we thought. So right now, big surprise, and I don't think it's been explained yet. So uh, this is what we do. We take these pictures of little fuzzy dots, exp try to get the colors, try to get the spectrum, the rainbow for each one, and then we draw you a long mathematical story and eventually we'll be able to say, this is how we think it worked. We're even able to get pictures of material orbiting around a black hole. Uh, so, of course, you can't see a black hole. The thing comes out of a black hole, but you can see things orbiting around one. So here we're looking at the chemical constituents of material orbiting around a black hole uh, and how fast it's moving even. So looking pretty far back in time, 11 and a half billion years back in time to see how, what were the black holes like. So uh, you probably know every galaxy has a black hole in the middle, that we don't know how that happened. We don't know if the black hole made the galaxy or the galaxy made the black hole. It's a chicken and egg question for astronomers. Another thing we can do is uh, take that magnified image and see what is in the galaxy way out there. Uh, and we see these little clumpy things they call this sparkler galaxy because just the, because of the way that it looks. Uh, but um, astronomers are now writing p papers about these objects. These, these little specks and dots that they found here might come even before galaxies. So one of our questions is, did the galaxies come before the, these objects or did these objects merge to together to make a galaxy? Here's an even more surprising thing. We found that um, the places where um, and the magnification from that gravitational lens can become infinite. Uh, that is to say, unlimited. So once in a while, a star just gets magnified by 100,000 times or so. And that's amazing, and we use that to say, well, what is that star like? And they've actually got a, 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 some details about it. So we got, a, a, we got its colors. So we, now we, we think we know what kind of star it is. So we're also looking at uh, galaxies that collide. This is a collection of five galaxies. The one on the left is actually not colliding with the other four. Uh, and it's so nearby that we can see individual stars in it. The other four are in the process of merging. And uh, once, when the galaxies collide, uh, stars pass right by each other, but the gaseous material does not. And it gets uh, stimulated and pushed around and new generations of stars are being born. So I don't know if my laser pointer will work. We could try it. Mm, anyway, you see the, uh, the pink arcs out here. That's where new stars have been born because of the, the collision of the gaseous material. We've got another collision going on. We can watch this one. This one is called the Cartwheel Galaxy for obvious reasons. And the story we tell is the little red galaxy in the upper left went square through, right square through the middle of the big one. And what we're seeing is a splash. So that ring of new luminous material around the outside is where the gaseous material was squished away and new generations of stars were born in it. So we've even seen galaxies that look like slice of a sponge. Um, what we see here is a galaxy that looked a lot like an ordinary spiral galaxy a long time ago when we didn't have the infrared capability. And now we see it's got holes in it. Uh, and the holes are made when stars blow up and uh, start to push away the material around them. So it's, it's it's a, almost a, well, it's a similar process to what makes a sponge, because when you make a sponge, the gaseous uh, pressure pushes away the rubbery material, and so um, and now we can see it. By the way, a t place to thank uh, a, a, an amateur image processor. Judy Schmidt is a person who sits in her home in Modesto, California. She gets our scientific data, and she shows them better. She adjusts the image so you can see these patterns. So astronomers love them because they look better and they also help us see and understand better. By the way, maybe it's a good chance to say that since you can't see infrared light, all these colors are artificial. The 
course, they have to be. Uh, but we try to make them with a the system that for your eye, the short wavelengths are, are that when, when you see a short wavelength, you see blue. When you see a long wavelength, you see red. In the middle, we see yellow and green. So we use a similar system when we make up our artificial colors for infrared pictures. Here is a picture oops, of a, uh, something we call the pillars of creation, or it's, it's a, a, a very different version from what we got with the Hubble telescope. Um, what you see basically is there's a wind blowing through space, uh, coming from the upper right and blowing away the material. There are stars being born inside this dust cloud, and some of them are starting to peek out. Uh, you can see that the infrared light lets us see through the dust cloud a bit. So this is another laboratory that scientists have to understand how are stars like the sun being born today. Looks like cosmic weather report, doesn't it, with all those hot and cold plant fronts and things like that. It's not so dissimilar. We use very similar equations, uh, and we do the same kind of supercomputer codes that the weathermen use. Anyway, here is a picture of a, we got a, a star that is being born today, right square in the middle, uh, in that middle of that dark bar through the hamburger is a star being born. Uh, we are looking edge on to the orbiting plane of the future star, uh, planets. So if you come back in 100,000 years, that little dark bar where the hamburger is is going to be gone, and the uh, planets will be visible. So it takes a little while. Uh, so what we see actually is dust and gaseous material being blown away during the birth of this particular star and planet system. We are looking at other planets around other stars, too. Uh, we have a couple of ways, but this is the powerful way that we're using now. Um, we wait for a planet to go in front of a star, and we know when it's going to happen because we've been watching in lots of stars for a long time. So we know when to look. So what we see is when a planet goes in front of the star, the star appears to blink. And we say, OK, something happened. If it goes around every seven days or so, we say, OK, must be a planet that takes seven days to go around the star. So now we can calculate a lot about this object, how warm it is, how big it is. Uh, now we want to say, well, what about the atmosphere? Does it have an atmosphere? And if it does, then some of the atmosphere, some of the light from the star would go through the atmosphere of the planet on its way to our telescope. And we could be able to tell something about the atmosphere. So we, we can, we do. So we are looking at small planets and big ones. Uh, so far, uh, the obvious question is, are there any small planets like Earth that have an atmosphere? The answer is not that we know about. Uh, we don't know whether we should be disappointed or surprised uh, because we weren't looking in the best place, but we were can, looking in the place we can look. So we do know that bigger planets do have uh, atmospheres and molecules just like Saturn and Jupiter do. So I can give you an example of one of those. Um, here it is. Uh, we have four different ways to get the rainbow or the spectrum of the, of, the, of the planet's atmosphere. So these wiggles that show the curves going up and down are due to chemicals in the atmospheres of those planets. And we were already able to say that this particular one, which is a big hot planet, has uh, sodium and potassium and water and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide and even sulfur dioxide. It's not a place you'd want to live, but at least we know our technique is working and uh, we know what to do for ne the next generation of these targets. We are looking in the solar system, of course. Um, here is a picture of good old Jupiter. Again, the, picture, the colors are artificial uh, because we can't see infrared with our eyes. So Jupiter, now you can see, has a ring as well as lots of planets. It has an aurora at the, both, both the, north and the north and the south pole. Um, and we can see details of the atmosphere and the storms, and the big old red spot is no longer red. So Jupiter is beautiful, and there's an awful lot of science to be gotten out of this. We'll get the chemical analysis by and by. We have attacked an asteroid. Whoops. Uh, it was called the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. So um, a completely other project, they, they sent out a probe to hit an asteroid with a big chunk of metal to see what would happen. How far does it move and what does, is there debris that comes out? So we watched it. Basically, all the astronomers who had telescopes, they could do this. They took pictures. 
So the Hubble took pictures, and that's the one on the left. The one from the Webb telescope is on the right. And we learned something um, about what comes out, but also the uh, object mo moved about five times as far as it would have if it had just been billiard ball collisions. So that's good to know because we may, I hope we don't, but we may have the requirement to redirect a, a killer asteroid coming in. But NASA, NASA has the job of counting them all. Uh, so far, none of them look very hazardous right now, but we are certainly on the watch. We have taken a picture of Titan. Titan is a remarkable satellite of Saturn. It has uh, got a surface of ice, and it has weather with rain and lakes and rivers that are made out of hydrocarbons ethane and methane especially. And so it's an interesting place to go study mm, geology, although you should call it titanology. Um, and we are planning to send a helicopter uh, to land there and to take short hops around to see the surface close up. So that's to, to land in year 3034, which is not so many years away now. So for now, we are taking pictures and getting the chemical constituents of the atmosphere of Titan and watching the weather on Titan. We've gotten a picture of Neptune. Come on, here we go. Neptune, uh, as the other outer satellite planets do, have rings around it. Uh, and here you see that they have uh, uh, mythological names. Uh, so well, our job now is to understand the planet itself and what's in the atmosphere of that planet. How does it work? We also have gotten a picture recently of Uranus, come on, which is the only, only planet in the solar system where the spin axis is more or less in the plane of the orbit instead of perpendicular like the Earth is. So that's why we're able to get a picture of the rings uh, so beautifully spread out before us. So this is another amazing place, a chemical laboratory to understand how that all works. So to wrap up the story about the Webb telescope, there are lots and lots of social media. If you want to see our latest information, you can just Google JWST images. Uh, or then you all have, of course, we have our standard kinds of, of uh, social media communications. Um, so that's that part of the story. Now I wanted to show you a little bit more about what astronomers are going to do next, because there is a lot of history in coming in our future. Uh, so here's the next telescope to go up. This is a European one, and it's going to go up on a SpaceX rocket after the Russians started messing around in Ukraine. We're not going to play with them anymore. Um, so this is a telescope relatively small, but it's supposed to go look for uh, cosmic dark matter and dark energy by seeing what do they do to galaxies. We are uh, finishing up a telescope on the ground in Chile. It's a bit named, named for Vera Rubin. Uh, an astronomer in Washington, D.C., and she was the person who basically said, there's dark matter out there. And she did not get her Nobel Prize. Uh, many people think she should have, but at any rate, we're naming a telescope for her. Uh, and this is a totally astonishing piece of equipment. Uh, the mirror is 27 feet across, and they're going to take a picture of the entire sky every three nights. Well, the point of that is to see, does anything change? So probably, yes, they expect 10 million things to happen every night. And uh, you don't think of astronomy as being about things that change, because mostly the things we know about don't. But some things do. Asteroids go zipping across. Stars have, ex have uh, weather. They have flares. They have storms. Once in a while, they blow up. And we have uh, novae. We have supernovae. So they're going to give us a long list of things to track down. And we're going to get alerts from them every day, please to point your telescope over there. So it's a finder chart for exciting things. But I have to wait a little while for till it's online. We are even naming, uh, and fly, we are, the next NASA telescope is this one. It's named for Nancy Grace Roman, who was an astronomer, the head astronomer at NASA, and she was a Swarthmore graduate. Yay, Nancy. So this uh, telescope is bigger and more powerful than the, than the Euclid mission, and it uh, will also be looking for the signs of dark matter and dark energy, and also will have a camera specially on board to look for planets. We do it by trying to block the starlight with a special piece of equipment called a coronagraph, uh, and 
This is our first time to fly one specially designed for planets. So we'll see how well it does. It's a small telescope that is to say, well, these days it feels small. It's as big as the Hubble. <laughs> and we, we, NASA, got a gift from the Defense Department to get the, uh, the telescope mirrors. So what are we going to do next after this? We want to build a, tele a thing called the Habitable Worlds Observer, which is the same size as Webb, at least, and capable of intentionally looking for Earth's orbiting stars like the sun. So why would we look there? Because the Earth is the only example we know of where there is life elsewhere. So better look where there is a chance to find something. So this is a very hard thing, but we are going to try it. That's what the National Academy of Sciences said, do this. And when they tell us to do that, we like to try. So uh, another thing to show you is we are building gigantic telescopes on the ground. Um, there are three gigantic ones uh, being built now, uh, ranging from 24 and 30 meter diameters. That's, what is that in feet? Uh, 75 to 90 feet, something like that. Uh, on up to the European one, which is 39 meters in diameter. It's almost the width of a football field. Man, it's that big. So there, that one's going very well. They're building it now. It has about a thousand little glass hexagons to make up the big mirror. So that's a wonderful challenge. And our job now is to say, well, that's the best way to use that. So astronomers use something called adaptive optics to compensate for the turbulence of the Earth's atmosphere. So the picture here shows that uh, you can do this. If you've got something to focus on in outer space that you think is a star, then you adjust your telescope mirrors, uh, make errors in the mirror to compensate for the errors that are produced in the atmosphere above us. And now we can get a sharp picture. So that's called adaptive optics. And so we know how to do that. Uh, it's pretty hard, but we know how to do it. And I put the picture on the right because if you go to your eye doctor, they can do the same thing for you. Um, if, you need to, if your doctor needs to see the back of your eyeball very well, and your, the lens in your eye is not perfect, so we can do it right there with this method. And if you really want to see better, you can. Um, football players get this done. You can see you get 20-10 vision. Uh, and if you're trying to catch that football exactly, you might need to know exactly where it's going to be, so they do this. So who knew that, uh, that the technology that astronomers need would end up in your eye doctor's office? So uh, that's not the most astonishing thing I have to tell you. Um, I'm now working on an idea called an orbiting starshade. And this is now in the phase of sending out uh, requests for college students to work on it, because we don't know how to build this thing yet. But if you could put up a, a starshade, a, a big thing to cast a shadow of a star onto the telescope on the ground that I just showed you, you would be able to take a picture of another solar system and get an image of the Earth, Venus, and Mars in a, in a one minute exposure. So that is so cool. Uh, so I think it's worth trying to do, even if I have no idea how to build it. So students are, that you know might just have a chance to do this. So I think maybe I'll skip over the next chart and talk about how far people can go, because people always want to know how far can you go. And the answer is not very far, unfortunately. Those wonderful stories you see on TV and read in books and all, all the, sorry. But um, something that's not been written about very much, but maybe we'll be hearing more about it, is what happens when the artificial intelligence gets going. And, uh, and artificial intelligence can have its own satellite or be its own satellite. So I don't know about this one. Um, we know we are developing that very, very rapidly. And obviously, people are concerned because it's risky, uh, but it's also very powerful. So not to say that it's easy or it'll happen soon or that I know what will happen, but it's going to happen. Something will happen based on that. So humans are fragile. We cannot go very far without dying. We need air. We need the right temperature. We need food, water. And we have to be protected from cosmic rays, which are charged particles that come from above. And here on Earth, they don't, they're not much of a problem. But if you're in outer space, they are a problem. And if, you're out of, if your trip to Mars takes more than a six months or a year, you could be pretty sick by the time you get there. So got to be in a hurry. When you get to Mars, you probably want to dig in, live underground. So we've got interesting challenges to when we do get to Mars, but we're going to work on it. 
So the last thing I'm talking about here is when the artificial intelligence gets good enough to say it wants to go somewhere, then it's still going to, be, have, to have to be very patient. The technology that we can imagine today is going to take 100,000 years to get a robot to go to the nearest other star. So if that other robot really wants to go, it's going to have to say, bye, guys. Talk to you in 100,000 years. And then, well, anyway, that'll be an interesting challenge for the future. So let me wrap up, and I'll be happy to have questions. So I think we have an arrangement for people to come with a microphone uh, if there's a question. So I think you raise your hand if you want the microphone. Is that right? OK. So I see some hands. Thanks. Have you heard that um, one theory is proposed that dark matter might be uh, neutron stars from early in the uh, universe? And there's, is there any way to, to prove that? I know it's a little too far out there to, you know, off the top of your head, but. Yeah, so <laughs> there are a lot of ideas of what that dark matter could be, and um, we have not settled them. Uh, the uh, people have been looking in laboratory experiments for uh, decades, and we haven't found a blessed thing. Uh, which means whatever we're looking for is not the right thing. Um, and it might be that it, we'll never find it in the laboratory. Um, the idea you mentioned that maybe this is the debris from first generations of stars is not so impossible, but there are arguments against it because that would have, it would have changed the story of the early universe if that were true. So mm, right now, don't know yet. As usual, I don't know, ask again later. Uh, or more questions. Uh, when you color these infrared images, when you put false color on them, is there a, some human judgment involved in how to do that? Do you have to pick the uh, you know, subdomain of the infrared band that is actually going to be colored and the rest will be ignored? Uh, is it just a linear map from infrared to, visual, for, to visible color? How, and do we get various versions of an image that could have very different impact both on you know the emotions of a human viewer and the uh, scientific inform information it reveals yeah you're completely right um, every picture is different we have diff so for instance if we have a camera that has like two filters then it's pretty simple to make some choices we just adjust two colors so they look right if we got like seven or ten color colors that we've observed that's more <clears throat> That's more than you can see with your own eyes, so uh, some judgments required. <clears throat> we probably have to do it more than one way because there's so much information. So we adjust it till we see what we think is in there and can begin to appreciate it. So there's art required, absolutely, yeah. So we need it to make, give it meaning as well as to make it beautiful. Yeah, thanks. The, the reason for the projected lifetime of 20 years. The mic on? Say that again, please. Sound wasn't good. What's the reason for the projected 20-year lifetime? Oh, right. Um, the, the observatory needs fuel to keep the orbit correct, and once in a while to compensate for the fact that sun is trying to turn it over with the force of the sunshine. You don't usually think that sunshine has a force, but it does. So we have to use rocket jets occasionally to deal with that. So anyway, when we run out of fuel, we're done. But the uh, micrometeorite uh, hits. Yeah, so I didn't mention it, but yes, we are subject to impacts from little dust grains in interplanetary space. They're about as big as a small grain of sand, and if you had one in your fingers, you'd hardly know. Uh, but when they hit you at 30 kilometers a second, they would hurt. Uh, like they have as much energy as a baseball. So, okay, so they can make a dent. So we have about um, 20 or so little holes where we don't care. And we have one big bump, and we don't know exactly how that could be because it's so different from the others. But at any rate, no, we're, our fingers are crossed that we don't get many of them. 
there okay. any recent uh, research on white holes? Ah, research on black holes? White holes. White holes, okay. Um, white holes are a hypothetical thing. We can't, we're not aware that we're looking at any of them in space. But when you imagine um, the equations that describe a black hole, you say, well, what if, what, what if they run, run that backwards in time? What would that look like? So we're hunting, or people would say, well, if, you, if there was one there, what would it look like? So far, we haven't noticed any, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. Um, assuming you're, um, you could just snap your fingers and make the money appear, which is obviously the challenge most of the time, uh, what is your position on um, interferometric uh, telescopes? Ah, interferometric telescopes basically um, are well, they're already in use for long wavelengths. For radio telescopes, we have antennas that collect, and we have lots of parabolic dishes, and we collect the, cable, collect the information with cables and bring them to a center computer and calculate a, an image. So we already do it a lot for that wavelength range. We don't do it much for short wavelengths because it's harder. Um, but it's definitely possible. And the sort of most ambitious thing we've heard about is, could you get two telescopes um, capable of seeing little planets around other stars and then combine the information at a center collector to determine a map of the surface of another planet. Well, this is so hard it's hard to imagine, but uh, at least it's fun to talk about. <laughs> so people take it seriously. We'd like to know what it would take. Uh, and then we say at the end, well, I'm sorry we can't build it, but yes, we'd like to be able to. So yes. Could you tell us a bit more about the formation of atmosphere around planets? And if, if, things, if everything starts from hydrogen and helium, and then there are nuclear things that happen, why wouldn't they happen around all planets of the size of the Earth? Is there some kind of magic about yeah, ours? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, um, so you're basically asking, how is a planet formed? And uh, the large planets in the outer solar system, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, are gaseous giant planets, and the composition more or less matches the composition of the sun. So it's a similar, anyway, somehow similar. Uh, the Earth is a little rocky object, and so it's formed a completely different way. So the idea is uh, dust grains orbiting around the sun, uh, little sand grains, eventually able to stick together, uh, and then they get more and more bigger and stickier until they get to be balls and boulders and big enough to actually accumulate to form a rocky object, like what we have today to live on. And th the presumption is that's so hot that most of the atmospheric constituents, like ni nitrogen and oxygen and uh, hydrogen, would, would be vaporized, it would just not stick. So the idea is a very hot rock as the uh, young Earth. And then where did, well, how can you get an atmosphere out of that? So it has to cool off so that an atmosphere can stay. And then maybe we're bombarded by pieces of the outer solar system, asteroids and comets. So it's a wide open question right now, where did the water come from? Uh, so water, some, some parts of the water could have been in the rock, even though it was so hot, uh, but maybe not all. So how would you know? We are looking for a place, you know, water has isotopes. Hydrogen and oxygen both come in different isotopes. So you look to see, is there any water in the solar system elsewhere that has the same ratios as we have in the ocean? So that's a wide open question and we're arguing about it every week. So <laughs> we'll, find, well, we'll tell you more in a little while. But we probably won't be sure either. Will you be able to use this telescope or subsequent telescopes to understand the formation of the heavier elements? As I understand it, neutron star collisions are involved? Yeah, um, we have, we've had a general understanding for a long time, um, which is uh, if we could understand how stars explode, we'd know. But it's a pretty tricky thing to understand because the computers are not able to do it for us. Almost everything else we can simulate, but when a star the size of the, of a, a large massive star blows up in a supernova, 
the calculation is too hard. So we do not know what to expect. So all we can do is measure. So um, for a long time, we thought, well, that's the source of everything. And then a couple of years ago, it was discovered that there is a, because of, we, we discovered gravitational waves coming from the merger of two neutron stars. So what's a neutron star? It's the leftovers from a star a little bit more massive than the sun. It's burnt out and shrunk to the size of 10 miles across. So that's a neutron star. It's all made of neutrons. And so what happens when two of those get together? Um, some turns into a black hole and the rest comes flying out. And so that seems to be the origin of the cold on my finger. So how did that happen? Well, that's a pretty rare thing, but it's, a, it's enough. So that's the story of the very heavy elements. And um, we're still arguing about it, but that's the new story that we have since the last few years. So that's the first time we were able to ever know that that event occurred because of the gravitational wave and told us where to look. And then we could see, oh, there was a flash over there. And then we see what are the chemical elements in the flash. And so mm, now we have a story to tell you. Uh, more questions? Uh, hi. Um, I'm from LaGuardia Community College in New York City, and um, I'm taking Astronomy 101 in a few weeks. So this is all new to me. Um, I have a question might be unrelated, but um, you know, like for example, they're on Mars and they have like uh, the, uh, like the Curiosity robot there. When they take high, defin high definition pictures of, um, of Mars, for example, and they like search for things, like the search for life, for example, is there somebody assigned to that picture that manually has to look with the highest resolution, like each part of the picture to discover something? Or is it automatically like a process through computers and stuff? Mm, I'm not quite sure I get the gist of the question. Um, so we do indeed uh, obtain these very high definition images, um, but quite a lot of the time you were seeing things that are mostly just little point objects distributed around on the picture. So to get a really high definition picture of say something like the surface of Jupiter, um, then every little detail matters. I don't think I'm really getting at your question, though. Sorry. Um, knowing there's very little magnetic field left on Mars, do you think it's that we can populate that, the, the planet? Ah, well, uh, so the, the question would be, why is there almost no magnetic field there? And why do we have one here on Earth? So here on Earth, we have a giant iron core, which is molten and is turbulent. And so it's a, we call it a self-generating dynamo. And so that's our story about the Earth. Uh, Jupiter has one, the Sun has one, um, presumably without any iron core in it. Uh, but Mars does not have a dynamic center as far as we know. So there's probably a good reason that it doesn't have a magnetic field. Uh, Venus doesn't have much of one either, or Mercury. So Earth is unique in that area. It's the only small rocky planet that has a big magnetic field. And it, Will we survive on Mars without a magnetic field? Sorry? Will we survive on Mars without a magnetic oh. field? Oh, yeah. So the question is, uh, how do you avoid the cosmic rays? Um, so on Earth, the, co the magnetic field helps to keep the cosmic rays away, and so does the Earth's atmosphere. On Mars, you don't have either of them. So your choice is dig in, put, put something over your head, put a big pillow, only you need uh, quite a few yards of rock overhead, actually. So it's a hard one. So by the way, if you uh, want to go live on Mars, you have to be really friendly, because you're, you're going to be living in a small minibus with your best friends for the rest of your life. That's the way it'll be now. Um, it'll take a while till we can bring you back. We have to learn how to manufacture rocket fuel on the surface of Mars to be able to bring you back. So that's hard, but it's not impossible. We're already starting. We can extract oxygen from the surface of Mars already. And the, the uh, poles have water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. There's water on Mars, too. Uh, we haven't demonstrated we can use it for anything, but it's there. Yeah. So I think there are a lot of questions more, but. Um, at some point, we're going to stop and to go to uh, personal questions up front. So uh, a couple more questions. Is, is gravity something for nothing? 
if, if it's energy and we have gravity, why doesn't mass decrease? Or, I mean, is it kind of something for nothing? Mm. You're asking one of the hard questions of life, which is what is gravity, what are space and time? And honestly, we can't tell you much more except we have some equations. <laughs> yeah, so what are they really? Um, I don't know. So we ask that question a lot, but we never can answer it. I think every physics student wants to know the answer to your question. Um, I still want to know. Okay, well, a couple more questions. Um, <clears throat> what kind of shielding would be required for um, a manned space flight to Mars? Okay, um, probably, we, well, we have two kinds of shielding we can do. One is uh, temporary shielding where you basically put yourself surrounded by a tank of water. Um, for a little while, because you can't afford a very big tank of water yet. And the other one is uh, try not to put up too much shielding because a uh, shield around you actually produces secondary particles which are worse than the original. So um, that's a pretty tricky question. Uh, ideally, we'd be able to make a magnetic field that would push the cosmic rays away, but we haven't solved that one yet. That's also hard. So the other version is just go quicker. And so Elon Musk will build you a bigger rocket. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, last question. Dave, Neil deGrasse Tyson just asked, what happens when you go into a black hole? So the consent of the universe response was, you go into another universe, which is impossible. Hmm. Okay. Well, so his question is about what's, what's really inside a black hole. And uh, it somewhat depends on how they're made. What, if you have a star that collapses, then what's in star inside, uh, if, you, if you were in there with it, with a collapsing bit of star, you would say, oh, well, it's just made of atoms. There was already at it. There was atoms when we went in, and we're still atoms. Um, but are you saying, well, does it connect to something else? This is a harder problem, and I don't think we can solve that one yet. So th that's his answer, but it's sort of tongue-in-cheek. Yeah, okay. Well, let me thank you all for coming, because there's so many beautiful questions and so many beautiful pictures, and thank you for being Swarthmoreans, because we have a lot to say.